Sometimes the Lord asks us to sit in uncomfortable soil, not because it's fun, not because it's fair, but because He wants to use us to bring change. Hey friend, this is the first episode of the all new Allie Worthington show. I have been producing this show for over six years, which sounds crazy when I say about it. And we've always had a Monday episode with an interview and then coaching and recommendations at the end. That's kind of my thing. But starting today, we're mixing it up. We're still going to have coaching and we're going to have interviews, but we're going to have two shows a week. Monday will still be your interview. But Thursdays are going to be different. Thursday is where I'm going to do my coaching. It's where I'm going to do encouragement. I'm going to do recommendations. It'll be more of a casual show, whereas Mondays are a more button-down classic interview. So I'm going to be doing it here on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, if you aren't subscribed on YouTube or you don't follow the show on the podcast app, please make sure you follow. So you will get that notification. These episodes are still going to be the longer interview where Thursday is just me talking to you about what's on my heart, something that I want you to know, something that I want to teach you. So just like the series we're in, Good to Great, I hope that this takes the podcast up a level and we continue to always innovate. We continue to get better and go from good to great. So this week, I'm with a powerhouse. I'm with Natalie Runyon for this week's Good to Great conversation. Today, we're focused on church, healthy church, being engaged in a healthy way, being grounded in your local church in a way that's life-giving to you and your community. This is such an important topic. And as we're growing as women operating in our potential and our power by the Holy Spirit, using all of the wisdom that we've learned through the years, it is crucial for us to take that same passion and wisdom to the church. And Natalie's going to help us do that. And now, without further ado, here's my friend, Natalie. Hello, my good friend. Okay, we are in our Good to Great series where we're taking all of these different things in life that are already good, but we want to make them great. Today, I want you to talk to us about church. You wrote another book about church, and why this one? Why right now? Why do we need it? And how's this going to help us take life from good to great? You know, the first book, Raised to Stay, addressed so much of what was wrong with the church. We we looked at, you know, why was deconstruction a buzzword? Why was a generation saying, hey, I can do life without church. I can figure this out. I can watch online. And so we kind of unpacked and deconstructed a little bit in that book of church hurt, what it is, what it's not. But I was interested in the scriptures when I read whenever Jesus had anything torn down or whenever God in the Old Testament had something torn down, there was also a rebuilding. And so writing a second book, it felt like there needed to be a response to Raise to Stay. And so Mm -hmm. when I looked at Raise to Stay, I said, okay, we tore down some religion. We tore down some things that we've been carrying that weren't of the Lord. But I believe that God is inviting us to rebuild something beautiful with him. And so I began to look at the book of Acts and this title, The House That Jesus Built, just kept like echoing in my head, like, What if we took what was good? God's church has always been good, but what if we could make it better? And what does it look like to make the church better? It looks like building with Jesus. It looks like the church of Acts. It looks like getting back on mission with the great commission and the great command. And so this second book is really a response. It's really a a rebuilding opportunity, not to rebuild something in our flesh, but to rebuild something beautiful with Jesus. You've crossed the country in the past two years sharing the message, serving. We got to serve at an event together in Atlanta last fall. That was so fun. You wore the most fabulous sequin pants (laughs) I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, even if I didn't (laughs) like this woman already, I would fall in love with her for the fact that she's like, I'm about to lead worship and I'm about to preach the pain off the walls while wearing (laughs) sequin pants. Respect. I wish I could have had more time with you. I had one of my sons with me at that event. And of course, we went to go ride roller coasters after because- Preaching and roller coasters, it's really a perfect day. But you've talked to so many women, so many church leaders. I know in every church it's different, but do you see patterns of of where churches have kind of gone off the the best path and are leaving, especially women, 
feeling like they're on the outside or just leaving people with a lot of church hurt? I think that what I'm noticing is that, first of all, there are more good churches than bad churches. There are more healthier pastors and unhealthy pastors. And I, I think it's important to say that because social media can make us feel like it's all lost, right? If we all, if we pay too much attention, but I want to encourage church leaders. I want to encourage those in ministry that God is doing good things in his church. But I also believe that because we're human, because we're fallen, because God has entrusted his perfect church to imperfect people, there's always room for us to look at our foundation and say, where have we allowed some cracks that have hurt people? And when I look at the upper room, I see a bunch of people that were waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I also see them going through a process as Peter begins to prophesy that everything that's happening is according to the prophet Joel. People begin to say, well, what do we need to do to be saved? And they start going through things like repentance and baptism and community and breaking bread. And when I look at churches right now, I'm seeing broken foundations that are not irreparable. It's just that we need to all be in unity, that we want to fix what's broken. And repent for the ways we have allowed some of these things to happen because we have catered to celebrity culture. We have catered to abuse. We have catered to it out of survival, maybe, or just out of ignorance. And now that we're aware, let's fix it. Let's be unified. And where there's unity, it commands the Lord's blessing. And that's where I'm seeing us reach for the best is reaching for God's best, not what's best for a pastor, not what's best for a denomination, but what's best for God and what's best for caring well for his sheep. Oh, that's so good. Okay. So for a woman listening to this going, okay, I'm all in. Where do I start? What does this even look like? Well, you asked about the women, you know, how have we kind of left women on the sidelines? And, you know, I believe denominationally that really is kind of individual for a lot of denominations. However, we can celebrate what just went through the SBC this week that women now can carry title pastor, which praise the Lord. He is literally taking the muzzle off of his daughters, denomination by denomination. And so I celebrate that. And again, we need to, as women, not keep demanding to be heard, but be faithful mm -hmm. with the spaces where God has allowed us to use our voices. And so I'm telling pastors all the time, like, look for the women who are on the sidelines, who have the ability to preach the gospel, communicate, and bring them in from the fringes because we have a generation waiting to come up behind them and use their voices. And we, our generation, has a lot of people to thank Beth Moore and Priscilla and Kay Arthur. We see these women who have toiled in this soil, and now we get to throw our seed onto it. And now this generation behind us will even get to build more. And so I'm just saying, like, churches, like, get ready. Whether we want women to speak or not, God wants his daughters to speak. And it's Amen. happening before our very eyes. So women, look for places where you're not tolerated, you're celebrated. And for some of us, that means moving churches. For some of us, that mm -hmm. could mean changing positions. But when we give God our yes and that merry position of be it unto me, as you have said, like the possibilities are endless because uh, God has used women to literally bring about the birth be at the death and be at the resurrection. So I kind of feel like women have been part of the entire gospel from day one. <laughs> it's like you had a plan. When you were talking about it, I had chill bumps. As someone that goes to an SBC church and, you know, I've prayed about it many times. Do you, do you want me to stay? And for me, it was, if everyone leaves, how is it going to be fixed? You know, my calling was definitely to stay, but how exciting is it that the things are finally changing? And I love like the whole idea of raised to stay is that sometimes the Lord asks us to sit in uncomfortable soil, not because it's fun, not because it's fair, but because he wants to use us to bring change through the prophetic, through prayer, through fasting. And so for those of you who have sat in that soil and prayed, this is the fruit of that labor. And we don't always get to see the fruit, but when we stay, we all we always see God make things turn out for his good and glory and for our good. And so that's the beauty of what I'm celebrating with my SBC sisters who have stayed is this is the fruit of staying. Amen to that. Early on in my work, I felt like God, he, he never told me this. So I don't want to, I don't want to tell a story that is saying God told me something because he's told me a lot of things, but this isn't something that he told me. It's something that he gave me a feeling about. So uh, Havila Cunnington would, would refer to this as just knowing. But I had this feeling that he was leading me with one point, and that is there are a lot of people who love God, but because they aren't spiritually or emotionally healthy, they can do a lot of damage. 
So what I needed to be focused on is to make sure that I was spiritually and emotionally as healthy as possible. But it's one of the reasons I write the books that I write and I have this podcast because, yes, we want to be spiritually healthy, but we got to be emotionally healthy because sometimes we can be spiritually healthy, but we're walking around just kind of limping because emotionally there's something there. And if we're not emotionally healthy, then we can do a lot of damage. There can be one of, like you're saying, a spiritual orphan coming in from deconstruction who's been out in the wilderness. And then if their first interaction with people in the church are people who are emotionally unhealthy, it's not going to help get them in the door. It's not going to help rebuild things. We're not going to help expand the kingdom. For too often, I think people have been focused on, let me make sure I'm in the Bible every day. Let me make sure I'm praying every day memorize some verses today and I'm good. But unless we're taking care of our emotional health, we can do a lot of damage. It's so true. And and I honestly believe this is why so many of us get wounded on church staff or in mm-hmm. high level volunteer because we're under someone who really wants to be a Paul, but they're living a Saul season. Oh. And, you know, they they believe that they want to raise up a Timothy, but they're jealous of the thousands that David's bringing in because they think that you know, we're going to outdo them or we're going to outshine them. And we find ourselves under somebody we respect and admire. And suddenly, rather than being our confidant and our collaborator, they become our competition. And we don't want that. And and that's why I've been really encouraging, especially, you know, it talks about how we have lots of pastors and teachers in the word, but not a lot of fathers. I would add mothers to that as well, Mm. that we really do need to be so emotionally healthy. And this is why I love Pete Scazzera's series, Emotionally Healthy spirituality and leader and all of that is because it takes what's underneath the surface and says, what have I not dealt with that could potentially harm someone should I find myself in a Saul season and I'm overseeing five kids in their 20s, right? And where could I lead them astray in my own insecurity? And so I think the stigma of not getting counseling and you know not taking care of ourselves needs to stop. Like We all need pastoral care. We all need biblical counsel. We all need wise counsel. We all need accountability. And That's where I believe that emotional health comes from is just saying, hey, that's me. I need help. I need someone to speak life and truth in my life so that I don't unintentionally harm someone because I'm not doing my due diligence to protect my own heart and soul. Yeah, I think for for anyone in leadership to not be in therapy, I, I would it makes me raise an eyebrow. Of course, 10 years ago, 20 years ago and longer, no one would ever admit to it, they would they would see a counselor in another city, right? Mm-hmm. If, especially if you're in church leadership. But there's so much of our own perspective that we can bring in and skew the messages that we're sharing. There's so much of our own hurt that we can accidentally inflict on people, whether we're in a, a ministry leadership role or a leadership role at our company or what we're doing. We need it. I remember when I was burnt out, end of 2020, beginning of 21, and I'm just in a terrible place. A a lot of people were end of 20, beginning of 21. I realized, I think when people listen to this, they go, yeah, me too. And I prayed and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And and he said, get help. And you know how sometimes the Lord will give you a word and then he'll illuminate everything he means around it. And I knew in that moment, he meant like, hire your business coach again get your behind back to therapy, go get all the help. Like it's my job as a career to help people. This is what I do. But I had just worked myself into a corner where I wasn't doing the one thing I tell everyone that they need to do. Like make sure you're working with a counselor, especially for coaches, make sure you have a coach too. So you're performing optimally. And the Lord was so gracious in that moment to just remind me, like do the thing you know to do. And as women, I think it's harder to go, let me go into a season where I am getting the counseling that I need, or I am getting the coaching that I need, or I am going to make sure that I'm as spiritually and as emotionally healthy as possible, because we are so busy doing for other people. So we have great intentions, but we can still kind of die on the vine inside and accidentally do a lot of damage in the meantime, even when we had the best of intentions, right? And I want to encourage women that even if you're not necessarily being unhealthy in person, we can be unhealthy online. The way we post memes, the way we're passive aggressive in what we share, the way we kind of say something without actually saying it, hoping one person reads it. Like 
we even have to be careful how we present online to not bleed all over the people who trust us with our content. So I'm having to learn that as someone who speaks to church hurt, that yes, God will heal me on the run, but he's also inviting me into rest and to to care for my heart. That's good. So if someone's listening going, I get it. I want to make sure my church is healthy. I want to step up and serve and add to that. I want to be a benefit. What are some signs of a healthy, flourishing church? And what are maybe some warning signs? As I was going through the scriptures, I realized like the blueprint of a healthy church is found in the scriptures. We don't have Mm -hmm. to recreate this. And so when I go into a church, I'm looking for upper room church. And what do I mean by that? Am I looking for like tongues of fire? No, I'm not looking for that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the Holy Spirit. But I'm looking for things that that first church in Acts had that then were carried over through Lydia, through Aquila and Priscilla, through John Mark's mom, Mary. I'm looking for signs that there is community. I'm looking for intercession. I'm looking for service. I'm looking for opportunity to serve my Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'm I'm looking for worship. Worship was a huge part of it. I'm looking for leaders who are biblically driven. I'm looking for the Peters who are going to stand up and say, no, no, calm down. This is exactly what the word says. I'm looking mm-hmm. for pastors who are true shepherds who have been like the disciples with Jesus. I'm, I'm looking for community that is all about what they can do for the church, not what the church can do for them. And so when you walk in and people know you and they they see you and they're hugging you and there's opportunity to go out and be the hands and feet in your city, when you have this deep prayer life as a church and also as individuals, when there's community groups, you're looking for your kids to have community. You're looking for the elderly to have community. You're looking for a multicultural. If you're in a multicultural area, you're looking for the people of your community to be represented in that house. You're looking for opportunities of all ages to be able to serve and get involved. That's how you know. Unhealthy things is when there's no point of accountability, no board, no elder board. If it's a lot of nepotism, if it's one family running the show, if there's no financial accountability, if there's no institution or any type of financial council that's overseeing how funds are spent, You're looking at, is the pastor emotionally and spiritually healthy? You're also looking for multi-generational. There's not many generations represented there. Probably not a place Mm -hmm. that you're going to want your kids to be walking into. You also are really kind of going off of that discernment of your heart. When my kids would go to churches and come back to me and say, mom, something feels off. I'm listening to my children as well. If my kids come out and say, I didn't really like the way that youth pastor made me feel. I'm like, okay, we're paying attention to that. So I'm not saying going into churches being suspicious. I'm going and saying, be discerning. Give a church three visits before you make your final decision if you like it or not. But you will know telltale signs because there will be things in their bylaws. If it's not posted on their website, if their mission and vision isn't very visible for you, if Jesus isn't the center of everything they do, you need to just get out. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. That's great. And then just some practical advice on just the average woman going to church. What can be a good first step to getting more involved and lending her voice and lending her talents in a church where maybe she hasn't before? One of the greatest gifts that we can give people in church is knowing their face and their name. And women, we're good at that. You know, we we have this relational ability, even when we're introverts, even in our Enneagram number, like we have as women, this innate ability to make people feel seen and loved. And what you don't realize is that when you recognize someone, when you remember their kid's name, when you remember that somebody had a surgery or somebody was had a party and, and you say, how was it? That means the world. So first step is just get to church and start memorizing names and faces. And when you see that mom in the kids ministry, if you see him in the bathroom, like so much ministry gets done in the women's bathroom of a church, Amen. just FYI, yeah. <laughs> but just, just make sure that you make people feel known. That's number one way to get mm-hmm. connected because then they're going to know you. And then you're going to look forward to seeing those people in return. Second of all, seek to be a servant before you seek to be seen. And what do I mean by that? For a lot of us women, we feel like that platform validates our existence. If I can just get up there and lead worship, or if I can just get up there and do the transition, or if I can lead a small group. And what I am learning about that is that the more responsibility that's put on me to be seen, the more pressure I feel to perform. Whereas when I'm just getting involved, 
really to just be among the people and to really just seek to be in relationship and go into those secret places of rocking babies in the nursery and serving coffee in the foyer. This is a way for me to get involved that allows me to have influence one person at a time before asking for these larger areas. And then as you begin to take more territory in the spirit, as the Lord trusts you with more Don't be surprised if you're not invited to go speak at a Bible study or a mops group or to do a small business breakfast. But just being available in the house shows people that you're there for them and not for an opportunity. And I think that we as women just have to remember that the way that God uses us is so unique differently than men. So just to be, yeah, just be available. Give them your yes. I love it, Natalie. Such a great message. Okay. You ready for some fun questions? I love it. Yes. Okay. Question one, let's talk about a song that you have on repeat. You're a worship leader, big worshiper at heart. What are you loving right now? You can be more than one thing. What yeah. what songs just make you go, oh, that's Okay, so it. I am obsessed right now with two. I'm, I'm Jesus Image is one of my favorite new groups to listen to. They're mm-hmm. out of Florida. Their uh, song, My Beloved Is, they just keep repeating it. I think it's called My Beloved. It's on my It's on my the car the minute I get in it's playing on Amazon music them and then mercy culture I have been playing mercy culture Jasmine is one of the best worship leaders I love to follow and so I've been listening to mercy culture so those are the two on my Spotify both nice. like I just put them on shuffle I don't even like have a song sound mind is like my song when I'm feeling anxiety that's great I'm just gonna start going to you what worship <laughs> songs are you loving right now because you <laughs> so you good. find great I've never even heard of either one of them you so. gotta go listen just put it on you will cry you'll be like laid out in your car <laughs> that is my thing when I turn on a new song and it makes me cry I'm like this is it Th- this so is real. what I've been missing my whole life <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great uh, what about TV show or movie what are you loving so I am a 90s rom-com like guru. So I have friends and King of Queens on repeat in my house 24 seven. So those are my sitcoms. <laughs> Movies yep. wise, just actually finished Girls Just Want to Have Fun. I'm an 80s like cult revive. I, I love that. So anything 80s. So Girls Just Want to Have Fun. I had that on the other day. I watched Troop Beverly Hills for the first time in forever with Shelley Long. I've never <laughs> seen it. I'm familiar. Is it, Come is on. it watchable? Yes. Oh my goodness. Troop Beverly Hills okay. is about like this Beverly Hills like Girl Scout troop. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I'm telling you is PG. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so those oh, are my like that. I watch those. I've learned with myself because I have this crazy travel life that mm-hmm. I have to watch things I already know the ends to to help me not have anxiety. Yeah. That's a so great I point. I don't really jump into too many new things unless yeah. I am confident that I know how they're going to end. <laughs> You need an emotional support show. Right I now, do. I with my 23-year-old and I, when we have time, we are re-watching West Wing because of an election year. And we're like, yes. this is this is our emotional support show. We'll just, it is. just watch an episode. That and Full House. <laughs> I'll watch Full House all day too. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, what about a book? What book have you read recently that you really enjoyed? Man, I am like, I love books. And because you know, as an author, you get books in the mail all the time. So the I time. am like, I have my hands in like 30 books, but right now I am reading a devotional called Sparkling Gems in the Greek. And it is about- I have it. It's like this fat, right? It's it's huge. It's it's purple. I am learning. My mind is blown. I am learning so much about what words really mean, what they really stand Mm -hmm. for. I'm spending like days in one scripture, just like devouring it. So, and there's a second one that I just found out about. So- Anyway, that's been my like kind of aha book where I just feel like I'm learning something new every day. That's so funny. Havila Cunnington shared it, I think on a story, maybe on Instagram, like 2016, 2017. And she was like, I can't believe I found it. And I thought, well, I need to get that devotion. And it is, it is a massive book and I haven't ever heard anyone else talk about it. That's so cool. It's, it has been one that like, I think I've had for like three years. I mean, I highlight it so much. Like it is like yeah. circled and highlighted, but it doesn't matter. I'll like go through it again. And I'm like, what? I didn't know that this time. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to hear that again. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now this one I love. Favorite affordable cosmetic, favorite luxury. Oh man, this feels luxury because $40 for concealer is a lot, but I love the NARS cream brulee under the eye. I just feel like it's the best. And the color, 
it just fits me and I don't wear a ton of makeup. So like, mm-hmm. I feel like I just love it. So the NARS, N-A-A-R-S, it's kind of, you can get on Amazon for like $38. I mean, but here's the deal, $38, but you only need to buy it once a year. That's right. I only use yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you break it up into, what is that? A few a few pennies every week. We got this. It's, it's girl math. I love it. Yeah, and, girl and, math. You know, Urban Decay, I love glitter, as you know. So I will literally put my in my eyes so much Urban Decay. So I will splurge for Urban Decay because I'm obsessed with their moon dust eyeshadow. And then my affordable one, I love all things elf. Mm-hmm. I am obsessed with the elf cheek stain. It's like a gel cheek stain, and that's yeah. like my favorite for the summer to look like I've got sun kiss at six bucks. Nice. I like it. <laughs> okay, final question. What about any random thing, a product that made you text a friend and tell someone else they needed to have it? I'm like a TikTok shop girl, man. If it's there, Ooh. I will buy it because I just am obsessed. But the food scale. There is a food scale that was like $19 and it connects to your phone. And I'm really like, if people don't know this about me, I was a kinesiology and exercise physiology major and I was a gym teacher and personal trainer for like 10 years. So I'm obsessed with food. I love fitness and all that. So I got a food scale and I was texting everybody like, it tells you the macros. It tells you the grams. It goes, it converts it into decibels. (laughs) So everybody was like, please stop telling me that I need to lose weight. I'm like, no, no, I'm telling you that this is like the best gift ever. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. I can't believe it can tell macros. It does. You have to connect it. You put the food in, like you scan it, and then it just Mm -hmm. tells you everything you need to know and what the portion size is. And then you weigh it and it tells you like, oh, you have 2.4 ounces. This is everything that's in it. I don't know. I I could just be geeking out, but I loved it. (laughs) That's pretty cool. I've said before, I think there's so many women in like ages 35 to 50, especially who have been so focused on raising kids or building a business or building a ministry or building in their career that now is the time when they're like, let me see what's in my food. Let me start paying attention to me. I kind of have a little wiggle room here. So things like that are really important. Yes. (laughs) I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Tell everyone where they can find you. Well, please follow along with Raise This Day on Instagram. It's a beautiful community. And then on Facebook as well, I have a private group. Just look Raise This Day up and you'll you'll be able to find it. And then both books, uh, Raise This Day is on Amazon and wherever books are found. And then The House That Jesus Built comes out September 3rd. Awesome. Thanks so much, friend. Thank you. How great is she? You know what time it is. It's time for me to start giving away books. I want to give away lots of copies of this book because it is so important. What you can do is you can take a picture while you're listening, share it on Facebook or Instagram, tag me, Allie Worthington, and tag Raised to Stay. That's Natalie's handle. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you for watching on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed, give it a like, and leave a comment. And most of all, I'm glad that you're here. I'm not only glad that you're here as support for the show, because I love that. I create the show for you, but I'm glad that you're here for you because this is an investment in you. This is an investment in your success in life, your emotional health, your spiritual health, the health of your career. It all wraps together and it not only helps you, it helps every single person in your life. I so believe in what's inside of you. I know what kind of person you are because you're here, because you're listening. There are million shows that you can listen to. Probably a gazillion shows have started since I started my show over six years ago, but you're here because you are the kind of woman who wants to go from good to great in all areas of her life. And I'm so grateful that you are. What I know about you is that God has created you to stand strong and bring something special and unique to this world that only you can bring. And I love to get to coach you and equip you every single week. So keep stepping up, keep showing up, keep loving well, because you cannot break a woman who gets her strength from God. I hope you have a great day, and I will see you again on Thursday. That's where I want it. Looks good enough. (laughs) And.